This is the Waldorf Blofeld synthesizer. It came out in 20 or 2007, actually, so 11 years ago. So you might be wondering why did I pick up a 11 year old synth in 2018 with the vast amount of choices we have today and all the great analog synths that are available. I guess it's a combination of different factors. Uh, primarily it's to get something with a sound palette that is complementary to the rest of my gear. So most of my gear is currently sort of vintage analog synths. I went through a bunch of different phases. I started off with plugins, um, switched over to kind of hardware synths. Then I got my first taste of modern analog synths. Um, then I kind of made my way and I got bit by the vintage analog bug. And then I started collecting analog, vintage analog synths. I've sort of come down to more of like a hybrid approach. I uh, used to be kind of a purist. Uh, and then I realized that was kind of silly. At the end of the day, the sound is what matters, not the actual technology or gear behind it. I wanted something that was kind of unapologetically digital. And that's where the sort of Waldorf stood out to me. Um, it definitely can do uh, virtual analog emulations, but that's sort of not its forte in my opinion. Um, and I didn't really get it for that purpose because I had those bases covered. So that was kind of the primary reason. And then there were other factors, uh, like I was also looking for a 49 key uh, MIDI controller at the same time. It's really a fantastic keyboard. It's got weighted keys, like synth keys, but they're nice and chunky. And there's aftertouch built in, which is great. So one kind of minor thing here is the aesthetics. So this is not a huge deal. It doesn't really affect the sound, but um, in a way it does, I guess, <laughs> at least for me as the keyboard player, when I'm in front of a synthesizer, the way it looks and feels definitely matters. It's definitely not the, the primary thing, but there's something about being in front of a nice looking instrument. <laughs> I know this is sounding super weird, but um, it definitely there, there's something, there's like a connection you have with it, similar to how when you sit in front of a really nice grand piano or like a Rhodes or something, there's something like raw and pure about it versus if you're in front of a synth with kind of gimmicky lights and weird color templates, obviously you can get the same sounds or like the sound doesn't, is not determined by the, the looks of the synth, but somehow like psychologically the way you play and interact with the instrument maybe is, I don't know, maybe I'm weird, but so that, that was definitely a minor thing, but it definitely helped me kind of nudge me towards this synth because it's got this nice elegance to it. And it's got a fantastic build quality. It's very solid and sturdy and much heavier than I thought it would be. Um, which I guess is a good thing. I'm not necessarily if you're gigging, but I'm not gigging. So uh, the kind of heftiness of it really helps make it feel more like an instrument. Oh yeah, and the other thing uh, which also helped me steer towards this synth is just the vast amount of synthesis uh, types that it can handle. Uh, so I've been kind of dabbling in subtractive synths for kind of a while now, and I wanted something to help me explore different kinds of synthesis which obviously you can do in a modular like a Eurorack or something, but it just gets exponentially more expensive if you want to just dabble into, for example, if you wanted to have FM and then wavetable synthesis and then physical modeling and then subtractive synthesis and then sample based. If you were to have all these synthesis types with the full uh, chain that is required to make them work in something like a modular, it would run you in many, many thousands um, and it wouldn't be super kind of uh, elegant, I guess, to have in a single box, you would probably have different boxes to share all that functionality. So having something all jam packed here makes it easy to learn on. And that's kind of one of the primary things I wanted to do. I, I was never really familiar with wavetable synthesis. I was familiar with the concept. I've played with some plugins, but I never kind of explored synthesizing and making my own patches using wavetable. Um, and then the, the ability to load samples here is another thing that drove me, uh, kind of nudge me in this direction as well. It's got this nice lo-fi quality, like it's not a full-fledged kind of sampler. It's not gonna compete with contact or anything, but it's got its own little character. You only have like 64 megs to load in or 66 or something weird like that. And, but what's cool is that it comes with this piece of software that you can just load in a bunch of WAV files, map them to the keys and then kind of load them into the synth here. So in the future, I'll definitely be making more videos about how to use that in detail. And then finally, the price, I guess. Um, it's not the cheapest synth in the world, but it's not the most expensive either. So it's got this nice niche kind of middle category. Um, it's about a thousand US dollars. 
And you can probably, most manufacturers or most retailers, I guess, don't carry them anymore, I don't think. Maybe you can pre-order them. It's an old enough synth that it's probably harder to find these days. I found this as a demo unit in one of my stores. So I got a bit of a discount. It's got a scratch here, but no big deal. Yeah, so it might be harder to find, but you can probably find a lot of them in the used market as well. So you can probably find them for a sub thousand, which in these days, I guess, might be a little hard to justify. A lot of people kind of downplay the synth saying, oh, it's, it sounds like a VST, might as well just get a VST, which for the most part, I guess it's true. You can probably simulate, and Waldorf itself has a plugin called Largo, which has Wavetable uh, and obviously, um, Massive and stuff like that has wavetables as well and is probably more powerful um, in, these, in this day and age because this synth is 11 years old. So the plugin technology has advanced quite a bit since then. So if you're a, a kind of a DAW plugin user and you're familiar with that workflow and you're okay with that world uh, and nothing against that world, I, I use plugins all the time and I like to marry sounds from both senses. Uh, but as a keyboard player, there's something about having, like I said before, like, the, like a, a self-contained unit that looks a certain way and that is kind of all integrated and connected. I know you can just MIDI out into a plugin and get a similar effect. Uh, but for me, I like just moving away from my computer from time to time, moving this into the living room or some nice setting uh, and just kind of programming patches and being focused in this kind of purpose de designed uh, interface here. So whether or not that's worth $1,000 for you is up to you. Again, it's got a really great keyboard, so you've got to factor in that cost as well. Um, a lot of MIDI, kind of budget MIDI keyboards feel very weird and spongy. And this has got a really nice keyboard, so I would play, give this keyboard at least like a $200 or $300 <laughs> kind of bump. And then the rest of the synth, whether it's worth it for you, it's completely up to you. Uh, you can find the spec sheet and all that stuff online, so I'm not going to bore you with that, but just high level. It's a really powerful synth in terms of modulation and in terms of uh, just the different possibilities that it has. So you have three oscillators and two of those have wavetable capabilities. So if you're not familiar with wavetables, I kind of glanced over it. Uh, so a standard oscillator generates a wave and you have like a single cycle that probably repeats over time. And normally that's in an analog synthesizer that's generated with electricity on the spot. And with digital synthesizer, with like virtual synths, you can generate the sound wave in real time, which is usually more expensive, or you can generate it by kind of predefining the loop or the cycle of a wave and then kind of looping that through. In a wavetable synth, you have effectively a table of single cycle waves. And usually they're kind of quirky, like you, you can load it with standard waves like a sawtooth or whatever. But the advantage of a wavetable is that you would load different variations of kind of more interesting waves into a table. So you would have a uh, basically a list, let's say, of 100 different single cycle waves. And then where the kind of wavetable synthesis comes in is you can modulate how which wave is picked at the given time. So you can think of it almost as morphing between one wave and another. And you can apply that morphing to any parameters. You can have an LFO kind of cycle through the different types of waves. And then the waves are interpolated while you switch from one to the other. So you're not getting like glitchy artifacts. You're getting kind of a smooth transition from wave to wave, which gives you this really, you come and almost have to hear it. Uh, it's hard to explain it in words, but there's a very kind of wavetable-ish <laughs> sound. It's got this like digitally glassy, but also really nice. And it's basically a sound that you can't really easily get from any other kind of type of synthesis. Uh, so, and Waldorf are kind of, experts, I guess, in that with their kind of microwave synths and their old their cues and stuff like that. So they definitely know what they're doing in the wavetable side of things. So anyways, back to the specs. So you have those three oscillators. The first two have access to the wavetables. And then you can actually also load a sample in any of the three uh, oscillators. So you can load like a piano sound and make that part of your synthesis batch. So you can combine the piano with like a sawtooth wave and run it through a filter and through the envelopes and everything. So that's the synth side. And then you have ring mod and noise, which is kind of our global features here. So you're, you don't have to use up one of the oscillators for noise. You can use three oscillators and then add noise, effectively getting a fourth oscillator in terms of noise there. Follow, uh, following that, you have two filters that you can run in series or parallel. And each filter has all the different types you would expect, plus a comb filter. Uh, which is kind of like a delay thing, uh, which you can use for physical modeling or creating effects like chorus and stuff. Uh, but then you have the standard low pass, high pass, band pass, notch, etc. 
and you can pan the filters left and right and you can route any of the oscillators into any of the filter by any amount so you get a lot of flexibility in terms of tone there and then in terms of modulation kind of standard sources you have uh, four different envelopes, which is ridiculous. So you have uh, ADSR standard envelopes, but then you have envelopes with multiple phases, like an ADSR followed by another uh, decay release stage, I believe. And then you have different modes. You can actually loop to the envelopes. You can have single trigger envelopes, uh, which is useful for kind of percussive stuff. But having four envelopes is really powerful. You can modulate all kinds of different sounds and you can have an envelope modulate uh, the wavetable position, for example, which is a cool sound. And then you have three LFOs with all your standard shapes, plus sample and hold and random and stuff like that. And then you have this really elaborate 16 slot uh, modulation matrix with really a wide range of sources and destinations, anything from uh, aftertouch, even polyphonic aftertouch as a source, even though this keyboard doesn't do polyphonic aftertouch, if you had a polyphonic aftertouch keyboard, uh, this synth can kind of respond to that. Um, and then you have Basically, most of the parameters you can tweak here are available as uh, destinations. And then you have effects and an arpeggiator. The effects are not the greatest, but you get basic reverb, delay, chorus, flanger, stuff like that, overdrive. I'd probably, in this day and age, use kind of external effects, but it's nice to add a little bit of flavor to a patch that's not completely dry, especially as you're programming something. Oh, one, one other thing I should mention is you might notice that this interface only has four knobs here and a couple of knobs here. And you might be used to modern synths having what's called knob per function, which effectively gives you one knob per function, so you're not having to share knobs, which gives you a much more immediate synthesis uh, and usually results in a kind of higher price for the synth. So this synth has sort of a compromise, um, and that's one of my main cons here is th the fact that it's not knob per function. But this kind of knob um, or parameter matrix is pretty intuitive once you learn it. So you have dedicated kind of buttons for your oscillator, filter, envelopes, and stuff like that. So for example, uh, the first parameter of the oscillator is shape. So if I change this. So it's pretty intuitive like that. You can jump to oscillator two and cycle through the oscillators. And then you have shape, detune, level, and these parameters are accessible. All the parameters that aren't accessible, you can kind of toggle through different sections here. And then these two knobs map to the two things you see on the screen here. So there's a bit of menu diving, but it's not really kind of intense menu diving. A lot of it is kind of direct mapping. You're just kind of switching what the knob does at any given point. But there's always kind of a direct link between the knob and the thing you have selected here. Let's start with subtractive, which is the thing most people are used to. So all the basic stuff is there. We have a sawtooth. You can load a different wave. So if we keep our sawtooth, we switch to our filter, it's default to uh, low pass. And you can change the type of the filter. You have band pass, high pass. And like I said, you have two different filters. You can kind of change uh, how it interacts between the two. So you can run it through a high pass and then a low pass and et cetera, et cetera. And then you have your basic amp envelope. Amp? Amp envelope. You get your basic pad sounds. Similarly, you have a filter envelope. All right, the next type of synthesis you can have is FM, uh, kind of very crude and basic FM. But you can actually FM using one of the LFOs, which can go up to 2500 hertz. Um, so you can effectively, if you combine the three LFOs and three sine waves with the oscillators, you could in theory have a uh, six kind of operator or not really operator because there's no uh, envelope going on per oscillator, but six sine oscillators uh, all FMing each other. And you can get pretty creative that way as well. But let me just demo a simple uh, example here. So you have a sine wave available as one of your choices here. And then let's say I pick a sine wave for my second oscillator and I'll reduce the level of the second one so we're not actually hearing it. But I'm gonna have the second oscillator modulate the first one. So FM source, I'm gonna pick oscillator two. FM amount, we're gonna increase that. So you can get your basic FM tones. 
And then obviously you can modulate the frequency of oscillator two and the level and all that and get interesting patches like that. And I'll definitely cover a lot of those in future tutorials. Then the other synthesis type is uh, wavetable synthesis. So oscillators one and two, if you scroll through, you get a bunch of different tables. I think there's like 60 some odd and each table has a whole stack of different um, And you use the pulse width uh, parameter to cycle through the wavetable. So you can hear the kind of sounds you can get with this. I'm just modulating this with my hand now. But for example, I can increase pulse width modulation from an LFO. And if I go to the effects, I can add a bit of reverb. So you got these really nice, interesting, glassy sounds. Um, and I'm just scratching the surface here with a super basic patch, but you can imagine applying different modulation to the different wavetables, and then you can load a second wavetable in the second oscillator. The other synthesis type, I don't know if it's considered a type of synthesis, but it's definitely in its own category, is the ability to load samples, like I mentioned. So if you cycle through all the wavetables at the end, you start entering the samples. So you have like a Rhodes here. Obviously it sounds super cheesy. And again, this is about, you have to think of this as sort of like a, a nice Wi-Fi or Wi-Fi, a nice lo-fi um, sample player thing. So don't compare this to like a contact or a rompler. Like if you're looking for piano sounds, don't buy this synth. Get yourself a, a digital piano or something or a nice uh, piano library, sample library. Uh, this is more for kind of quirky, like starting points for a patch. And if you think of it that way, then it becomes much more powerful. Uh, and you start, for example, this is a piano patch. Obviously, <laughs> this is not going to compete with a, a, like a dedicated digital piano or piano library, but that's not the point here. The point is that you're layering, let's say, how many other keyboards can you layer like a piano sample uh, with a wavetable um, oscillator that's being modulated through cycling through the wave? and then running it through like a comb filter and then adding a third oscillator that that is FM'd with the second oscillator or does FM by the piano patch and then running it through effects and then modulating that with four different envelopes. I mean, th that's where it kind of gets like, think of this as just a fancy oscillator rather than a dedicated sampler uh, for like pianos or something. So this kind of sounds cheesy on its own, but then if we layer uh, like a... And then we increase the amp envelope. Okay, it's not the greatest example in the world, but I think you... Like, it doesn't sound anything like a piano anymore. And that's kind of the point. And obviously I have the generic piano loaded in here, but like I said, it comes with free software that you can actually load your own sound. So I'm gonna be making a lot more videos trying to kind of push the boundaries of the kind of samples you can load here. But you can load, you can be creative here. You can like sing something and put that in. And the kind of the more lo-fi, the better in my opinion, because that's what I love about the sort of Casio SK-1 and the Yamaha VSS-30 and all those uh, kind of quirky toy-ish samplers is that they're so immediate and fun and kind of lo-fi, like unapologetically lo-fi. And, and that's what kind of, that's where, like the contrast from the kind of super accurate sample libraries, it's, sort of, it's almost like a punk thing, I guess, where you're kind of moving away from the perfection and you're, you're kind of embracing the quirkiness, if that makes any sense. But anyways, that's, that's sort of a kind of a general idea of what you can do here is that it's not any one kind of synthesis type, it's the combination of the multiple uh, types is where it kind of gets really powerful. Uh, so combining a standard sawtooth with a wavetable of like a format wavetable, which sounds a lot like a voice speaking, and then combining that with uh, 
I don't know, a patch a sample of a xylophone or something, and then FMing that with one another, then adding a bit of noise and running it through effects and all that. So definitely going to cover that in more tutorials. But I just want to give you a sense of uh, kind of how to think about a synth like this, which may not have the best raw sound. Like if you're comparing the sawtooth wave with an analog sawtooth wave, like you're you're doing the wrong comparison, to be honest. Um, but it's really the kind of the, the power in com combining all the different types and emphasizing that kind of lo-fi digital sound uh, for what it is and using it in its place. And that's where synths like this start to shine. And then the final type of synthesis uh, is physical modeling, which I'm going to make separate tutorials for because it requires a bit more kind of in-depth. But it, it, this is not a synth that's kind of geared toward physical modeling. It's more of a quirk uh, that you can uh, exposed from it because it has something like a, called a comb filter, which is basically a super rapid kind of delay loop, uh, which you can use to make effects like chorus and flanger. But then can you also emphasize uh, what's called a carpless strong algorithm, which is basically this kind of very elegant, simple, like surprisingly simple way to emulate uh, like a plucked string, which physical modeling is sort of that. It's It's the kind of modeling of physical instruments so like a plucked string or like sound going through a tube for like a wind instrument or hitting like a percussive drum and how the membrane vibrates and the carpal strong just gives you a simple way to kind of excite add a bit of excitement energy kind of what you would do if you hit or pluck a string and then going through a quick uh delay line emulates the kind of uh, resonance or the vibration of the string um and you can do that with something called a comb filter, which this comes in, and you can actually get pitch tracking uh, if you set the right um, delay time. Just pick the synth that sounds good to you, that inspires you, that feels good, that looks good. Whatever criteria you have, just own it, run with it, and have some fun. And I'll see you guys in the next one.